This is Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. I'm Adrian Buskey. This episode, I'm joined by author Robert Jackson Bennett. He's probably best known for his Divine Cities trilogy, and his latest novel, Foundry Side, was just released from Crown Publishing and kicks off his new Founders trilogy. Robert, welcome to Fictitious. Thanks for having me. So this is going to be a, a pretty crazy week for you, because as we're recording this, it's the day after Foundry Side just officially dropped into stores and on the Amazon and all the online places and stuff like that. So I know you've been doing Reddit AMAs and all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, what's that? What's the release week for a book look like for an author like you? Well, it's made a, a little bit worse because the Hugos were last weekend. Um, and uh, so, so the Divine Cities was up for the Hugo for Best series. So I went to, I flew out for that on Friday morning. Um, and um, the Hugos are Sunday night. So I had to fly back home with my wife on Monday, which means we missed uh, the first day of school for my kid because it was, of course, the first day of school. Oh. We were able to be here to pick him up. Uh, so going from central time zone to western, western to central, uh, especially after partying all, all night at the loser's party, uh, which is uh, <laughs> insane. Uh, it, it was a little bit exhausting. And then, you know, the very next day is um, when the book came out. And the day after that is our anniversary today. And um, then uh, tomorrow is actually when it comes out in the UK. And uh, I'm sure something else is happening. And then next weekend, I'm going to Dragon Con. So um, I've been trying. I think I might have overcommitted myself. But if this pays off, <laughs> then whatever. Considering the uh, the buzz that I've been seeing online just in the last couple of days since the book has been released, I'd say that there's a lot of online chatter about it. I mean, I I mean, I was uh, fortunate enough ahead of us uh, doing the the panel together at San Diego because you were on the, mm -hmm. the Here There Be Dragons panel with it. Um, I so I got I got an arc of it um pretty early on, and uh, I, I absolutely loved it. I mean, I like oh. absolutely 100 percent love the novel. I was really really into it. I knew within the first couple of chapters that this was like one of those those moments when like you have a book where you're like oh this was written for me like somebody yeah. wrote this for me and uh and so i was i was all in like you know from the very beginning and and really really enjoyed it so um i'm i'm really happy to see you know the the you know the buzz even just in the first couple of days of where uh you know the advanced readership and and reviewers and stuff been talking about it but i'm already seeing people who have picked up the book and have read the whole thing in the first day you know and then are tweeting about it like i just i well my day is gone but i you know <laughs> but i've already read through this so i mean that's it's got to be good seeing all of that it's it's nice. It seems to be doing well. It's always really hard to tell because the publishing industry is about a week delayed, uh, and really only then I think you, uh, that after that week you only get about eighty percent of the numbers, seventy to eighty percent. So it is it, it's tough to tell if you've been successful or not. It's like trying to go through a battle and then like you know two days afterwards you're still looking for bullet holes. You're like, did I make it? I don't know. I made it. <laughs> um, but uh, I, it, people seem to like it. People, uh, folks seem to really react to this book, which is nice. The thing that I like to see is that they that they think it's fun. And I wrote this book specifically because I wanted it to be fun and kinetic and like a big bouncy romp that still does some smart things, but is still functionally a fun story. Well, I the the comparison I've seen a lot, and I've used it even in my own review of it, is that it's it's like a like a caper film or like a heist story. Um, you know, yeah. very very much has that that ever growing stakes and that like constantly, you know, like kind of getting deeper and deeper into a big mess while trying to come out of a big dangerous place with something in hand. Uh, and it has kind of all the the right hallmarks of uh, of you know the kind of like haste genre or heist genre. And uh, I also one of the things I really loved about Foundry Side, and I and I'm not you know we won't get into spoilers or anything here, but like um, that it's it's very self contained in the sense that like. It's pretty much all in one city and it's a big epic story that takes place, you know, within a pretty confined environs and uh, considering like, you know, so much of fantasy feels like it has to sprawl, like it has to travel enormous distances in order to get to like, you know, just different plot points. I felt it was really refreshing to have a story that took place in a pretty centralized locale. Yeah, that's kind of my thing, though, because um, the way that uh uh, the Divine Cities uh, trilogy works was that each one more or less took place in one city, or at least kind of focused on one city. And so it kind of came naturally to do this uh, with uh, Tavon. Um, 
One of the things uh, that uh, kind of inspired it was uh, reading the history of, I think it was just just Venice. Uh, uh, yeah, it was it's mostly Venice. And the way that uh, those cities formed and the idea of, the, of uh, not a country but a city-state like uh, Greece and the way that they managed to project power and create empires and like hire armies and things like that and hire ships and like hire pirates and things like that. How, like the way that a city-state functioned in uh, the trading world was really fascinating to me. So it was kind of a sweet, it was kind of a sweet spot for me because I like to write about cities, uh, especially like the made-up kinds. But when you start to talk about the Renaissance and Venice and things like that, then it all kind of works into one thing, and that uh, those uh, city-states are such an intense microcosm right before you start to see more of the broader nation states that form in the 15th and the 16th and the 17th century. I mean, that's some interesting world building behind there. And I, I want to dig more into that. But I guess actually something we should step back in is is I'd like to hear in your own words, basically, like, sum up what Foundry Site is about. Well, the way the chief way I've been doing it is that it's a magic thief in a magic city. And then when someone says, that's it, I say, that gets you 60% of the way there. But um, the kind of thesis or like um, the main selling point is the idea that there's a place where someone found a way to use magic basically to to access and change the source code of reality. And then they did the thing that, that most people would do. They made a lot of money off of it. They made a huge trade empire. They have captured cities all across this one sea, like, like the Mediterranean. And now there are four trade houses that specialize in this magic called scribing. And then there's a thief who happens to work in that city, which is which has you know rich and poor. There's a huge distance uh, between the two. And this thief is hired for this one job. Uh, it's a high-paying job. She wants to retire. Uh, and she has to steal this one small box from a safe at a warehouse. And when she goes and steals it, uh, she suddenly starts to get a bit creeped out, like, why are they paying so much of this one tiny little box? So, of course, she opens the box, and she finds inside an item that could completely change what scribing is. And, of course, which would take away a huge amount of power from those that like scribing just the way it is, which makes a lot of extremely powerful people want this thief to be extremely dead. One of the things I really uh, glommed onto with this story immediately was the whole idea of scribing and the, you know, and the the nature of that as as part of your, you know, basically as your magic system. I mean, like magic systems are a big deal in fantasy. You know, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of fans uh, really, really want these very elaborate magic systems. Other fans like something that's a little bit more hand wavy and intuitive. Um, so you get a very it's a it's a, you know, your mileage may vary, you know, kind of situation mm -hmm. uh, reader to reader. Um, for me, part of my background background is as a web developer. And so, mm -hmm. you know, so I've got a code background. So immediately as I start reading this book, I'm like, oh, there's, these are basically if then statements, um, you know, written as magical code on, on these, on these items and altering their reality. And that made sense to me immediately. So I was like, oh, this is, this is magic for the, for the programmer, for the, for the developer. Uh, how much of a background do you have in any of that, that kind of thing? And how much does that idea influence what you were doing there? Well, I like tech, uh, and I follow it pretty close in the news. And actually, to prepare this, I mean, like I do some really basic stuff, like SQL for work. Um, and um, to kind of broaden my horizons, as I was writing this, I downloaded uh, a PHP uh, 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 simulator, and I took a like a crash course online, uh, which was you know kind of interesting. But really, you know, it's like most research where if you know the broad idea, then trying to narrow in on the details a whole bunch. Is it necessarily helpful? Uh, like I've talked to a whole lot of writers before where they say like, I did so much research and I used 5% of it, but it was really fun to do. And so I think w when you do something like that and if, like when you're trying to find not just something that you're trying to copy, it's not like nonfiction or you're trying to, to take something that's, that's real, but what you're trying to do is trying to find a point of inspiration. You don't need to do it the whole way. Uh, and I wanted this to be broad enough for everybody, but uh, that, that's it exactly. The, um, the way that I thought about this was I was driving the car and like, uh, and this was separate from my first idea about like what this book was going to be. There was the book idea and then there was, the, then there was like what the magic system is. 
I had just listened to, uh, I think it was Hello from the Magic Tavern. I don't know if you listen to that podcast, mm-hmm. but it's about fantasy. And like they talk about how the wizards, how they get their magic from like light and shadow or truth and lies. And like the, and it's a, this idea of like these two concepts and there's a tension that lies between them and that's how they get their magic. And so I started thinking about this idea of magic as abstract tension uh, between these two conceits. And, and so I said, well, what if it's like an argument? Like what if the way that magic works is that you have to convince something to change its reality? And so once I had that, I was like right away, I thought, oh, it's like a computer code where you have to define all these elements to kind of give the object – the grounding to understand what you want it to do. And it's going to be stupid. It's not going to be smart. It's going to want to stay and do uh, what it's doing. And then once you establish the instructions that you want it to do, it's going to follow them in the, in the simplest way possible. It's not going to think about the instructions. It's just going to try and execute them. So you really have to think it through. And as soon as I started thinking about this, I was like, there's a lot of ways for someone to blow themselves up screwing around with this crap. <laughs> and that was like a running theme in, in the book is like how dangerous this is and like how it's like, you know, cool and it can power all this stuff. But, yeah, you'll lose your face, buddy, if you're not careful. And uh, it, things just kind of went from there. Um, and it was about that same time, I think. I'm not sure um, where um, – a long time ago, I was uh, li- I was cleaning the house, and that's when I get a lot of my ideas. And uh, I was listening to St. Vincent's uh, Digital Witness, which is kind of weirdly futuristic. And I had this idea of a futuristic city where there's AI and everything, including the buildings. So all the AIs have personality. So, so like all the buildings have their own kind of personality. And there's a girl with a chip in her brain that that allows her to talk to the to the AIs. So that she can come in and like rob the place or sleep there or make friends with them. And I was like, that's a cool idea. But I'd have to learn a lot about tech and I don't really want to do that today. So I just kind of stuffed it in the back of my head. And um, it wasn't until later that I proposed to my uh, to my editor this idea of a magic thief in, in a magic city with these trade houses. I started thinking of it basically like this is like cyberpunk, but yeah. it's dressed up like fantasy. And uh, that was a cool thing, but the problem was that um, my was that my editor didn't like the bad guys because they were just rich. They were just rich assholes, and he was like, "That's not that interesting. You need to do more." And so I was kind of wandering around, and this was right at the same time that Lyft and Uber basically kind of like invaded Austin because they wanted to start to fingerprint uh, the drivers because there was some sexual assaults. Um, and like, it was crazy living here because there were posters everywhere and signs everywhere. And you were getting constantly like texts and emails, phone calls and commercials. And it was crazy. It's like, we're being colonized by tech companies. And I was like, wow, that's a really interesting idea. Maybe that's my bad guys. So it was these three very odd ideas and all the, that came from all these odd directions that sort of came together where it's a magic thief in a magic city with these giant companies that are like that are like tech companies that use magic that's like coding. And then bada bing, bada boom, here we are. I like the the fact that you said the you know that it's essentially like cyberpunk in a fantasy setting because very early mm-hmm. on I had that feeling there was something with uh, uh, with uh, Sancha if I am I saying it right mm-hmm. yeah there, there was something when, with with Sancha in the early parts that I thought of I don't know if you're familiar with it but there's a an old RPG like cyberpunk RPG called Shadowrun and mm-hmm. I had this feeling like oh Sancha is like a Shadowrun character like but in a fantasy realm because she could interface with this object empathy with uh mm-hmm. you know the essentially the code of the objects around her and that felt very much like an idea that you would run into in cyberpunk um except for in in the fantasy world and i i really really liked that concept um i think it's i think it's worth noting for people who are listening to this who haven't heard, haven't read the book yet that um that sancha has this ability to communicate well she can hear the code around her when she gets close to things she can hear the objects right like that's like like basically what's what's scribed on them to a certain degree she she can kind of pick up on that well at the start of the book she can hear it but she can't understand it so she can tell when something is scribed is close by and she can probably like identify it but she can't really get what it's doing or what it's been told to do but uh the thing that she can do is uh is if she can if she can 
can touch something with her bare skin, she'll know what it is like instantly and know all the things about it. Like, like if she holds a box, then she knows what's inside the box. Or if she is trying to pick a lock, she holds the lock with her bare hands and she can feel all the parts inside of it moving. And if she really wants to go nuts, she can uh, say she's in a dark room and she holds her bare hands to the floor. She can slowly start to feel all the all of the feet on the ground around her so she knows where all the people are and the ways that they're facing because she can feel their heels and how big they are, how heavy they are. So it's got a lot of uses, but it's also she can't turn it off. So um, she wears the same clothes every day because she's used to them. She doesn't like changing clothes because that she means she has to get used to a whole lot more sensation. Uh, she doesn't eat meat because her mouth – expertly tells her that it's that she is chewing on a piece of carcass and that's super gross and uh, she can't ever get drunk because that makes her brain really sensitive and that that's unfortunate because she lives in the commons part of Tavon which has no clean water so they have to drink weak wine all the time so she has to be really careful to make sure that she never gets drunk so at the start of the book she you know she has this cool power but also super sucks so she's trying to get money to try and find a way to fix herself because this is a result of something that was done to her. It is so since it was something that was done to her, she's looking to get it undone. Yeah, and it's like I thought it was an interesting thing that she has this this really unique ability, but it's painful for her that like mm -hmm. the more time that she spends uh, actually bare flesh touching something, learning about it, the, the the harder and harder it is on her body and her mind, and that it's like it's basically it causes her a lot of suffering in order to use that ability. You know, it's a it's a not, yeah, like you said, it's kind of a counterbalance. Like she has this really great thing that she really wishes she could shut off and get rid of because it's it's kind of horrible for because she can't. It's just a pretty lonely person because she can't really make person to person contact. With, right. with she, anyone else. Yeah, she can't touch people because when she does that, then um, basically it's the same sort of object empathy. But for her, like when she, when she touches people, you know, like like our brains are not a clean, neat feed of thoughts. It's a big, hot cloud of shouting feelings. And so it's super awkward to have someone's brain suddenly screaming in yours. So she does not touch people whatsoever. So she lives alone in a room that's completely empty. And uh, lives a pretty lonely life. Yes. And you've got this uh, this interesting cast of characters, and I want to walk carefully through this since uh, you know we don't want to get into spoiler territory. But like, um, you know, you've got this other guy named Gregor, who's uh, um, you know sort of a captain of a watch in this very loose, you know, kind of. Tavon like doesn't have uh, like a, a a typical city political structure because it's completely run by the merchant houses and Gregor is somebody who's trying to clean up uh, a lot of problems with it um, without having like a solid political you know system behind him um, and I thought it was interesting to have this guy that feels like a very stand up I'm gonna do the right thing guy um, but at the same time he will walk into a place and bust heads like a thug. And, uh, and I thought that was an interesting balance for a guy that, that there's clearly something broken about, but like, but is, is aspiring towards a greater morality. Yes. He, he wants the world to be better. And when it completely refuses to be better, he's not opposed to trying to break it open. He really wants to do good. And yet each time that he tries to do good, as we see pretty quickly in the story, it usually backfires pretty rapidly. But he doesn't care. He's still intent on trying to do the right thing because trying to do the right thing is a, is a worthy cause in and in, in, in of itself. So when he meets uh, Sancha, who's like super jaded, of course, and doesn't buy any of this, it's really interesting to see them kind of uh, try and have to deal with each other. My favorite character in the book is actually a character named Orso. I got the feeling as I was reading this character that you must have had a lot of fun writing him because Orso is sort of I, I would streamline it to say he's like sort of a master scriber a part of, the, mm -hmm. of one of the merchant houses and uh, he is he's got a nasty wit a sort of uh, I don't know high and mighty kind of air but grounded by like being completely uncouth and has. I would say outside of maybe one of the villain antagonist characters, the best dialogue of the book. And and so I just got the impression that like most of the time you were writing him, you were you were having a good time. Is that fair to say? Yes, I um, had I, the, the book changed a lot because uh, I like like went through a lot of changes, um, like some of them, you know, just what happened when and then some of them were a complete change in what the book was. But he was a constant factor. And every time that you first meet him, he's screaming at the top of his lungs at someone, like just bawling him out. 
And that was always just so much fun to write. And I think, you know, it's like watching the show House and that it's really fun to see someone who is so privileged and so smart that he can can get away with almost anything and saying anything. But at the same time, I think unlike House, acknowledging that this guy is like a complete asshole. And but but you start to realize and like I and I don't think that Foundry Side like kind of like valorizes him the same way that House did uh, House. And that, it, and that I think that the book makes it clear, like, it would suck so much to have to deal with this guy. But um, I think what is interesting is that he's not bad, per se, but he's amoral. What he wants to do is do really cool things with scribing and figure out how the world works. Uh, and that's all he's about. That's all he's ever been about. So when he runs into Sancha... And he and at first he's all about like, let's just leave her somewhere and just let her die. Jesus. Um, <laughs> he slowly starts to realize that she offers him some insights that he's never had before. And suddenly he's like, I like this girl a bunch and we should keep her around. Um, and it's and it's kind of fun to see him change through the book, too, where uh, the things that he's used to and the things that he is accustomed to get changed and challenge him. And so he changes quite a bit quite a bit over the course of the book too, as he's pushed out of his laboratory and out back into the real world. As you were putting this together, you've got all these, these very dynamic characters and you have, um, and I, and I will say like something that I really appreciate with the writing is that like, they all have such a clear, distinct voice, whether it is Sancha or Orso or Berenice. I don't know if, am I saying her name right? Yes, you are. That's how it's said in my head. But as it turns out, it's like an Italian, it's Nietzsche. So it's actually Berenice. But I was like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> okay. it's, it's just Berenice. Yeah, Berenice uh, and Gregor and uh, and Clef and you know, a number of these other characters. Like, I felt like really quickly in, you could strip all of the names off the characters and I would know precisely who everybody was just with a line of dialogue because they're very, very clear and very, you know, they stand out well. So you have, you have these distinct characters. You have a very distinct world in this, you know, city. But you said, like, you you kind of had three or so amorphous concepts that came together crashing together for this thing and that it was changing a lot over time what was your outlining process like when you were putting this thing together like how, how did you develop this out messily um i didn't <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not a big outliner but like when i sat down i was like i want to write a fun story about a thief in a magic city and so like i wrote this one version that had like trade houses and families and things like that but it didn't. It wasn't highly well, like industrialized. The magic system was a little bit less explained. And my editor was like, "This is actually too broad." I've never. I mean, I. It's weird that I'm saying this to you uh, because I write a lot of weird stuff. But he was like, "I need this to be weirder. This needs to be stranger." And I was like, "Crap! No one's ever asked me to do that." They're always like, "Can you pull it back a little bit? <laughs> Make it a little bit, you know, more mainstream." But this was too mainstream. So um, I had to rethink it a, a, a whole lot. That was when I started to think about trying to make it more like industrialized. And the thing that I wanted to avoid was that as soon as I said, you know, that everyone was like, so it's going to be like a steampunk thing, like Victorian England. And I was like, no, I mean, like, I don't want it to be like that because that's a very different thing. I wanted to feel more like organic instead of trying to copy a very distinct genre style that has its own tropes and its own history. And it wasn't until I started thinking about it like the tech industry and um, trying to make it almost like a really hellish kind of uh, Silicon Valley with magic uh, that I started to really sort of key in on how I wanted this to work. And actually, one of the last pieces to fall, in the, to fall into place was actually Sanchia. In the first version, she was probably a little bit closer to what someone would actually be like if they were an impoverished thief and that she was almost kind of like feral and chaotic borderline sociopathic because like she never had rules and people died around her all the time. So like she didn't think about it, about that at all. And she was loud and she was like rambunctious. Like, so that was the first draft. And then something just wasn't working. And I realized that the story that I wanted to tell was not about a person who had been shaped, but who had just been shaped by poverty to be chaotic, but someone who was actively suffering under it. And, and whose life had been changed by it and wanted to change into something better. I, so, like, I realized that, 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 I, that the way to do it was to focus on making her feel contained and, and limited and someone who has, like, no luxury. She thinks of, of, like, everything like a risk and a luxury. 
And so she, so she changed from being something that was like savage and, and a bit mad to being something that's shrewd and calculating and careful and thinks these through and never takes a risk unless she, unless she absolutely has to, because she's seen people die who do take risks. And she's like, nah, I'm not, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to risk this. And, uh, that suddenly worked. Uh, once I wrote her like that, everything suddenly clicked into place. When you, we first meet her and we really like see that, you know, she lives this very Spartan existence and lives sort of with the expectation that the very small amount of things that she actually has will be stripped away at any given time. You know, there are certain like an economy of lifestyle that um, that really makes sense there. And um, yeah, and I, I, that's interesting to think about, like that, that the character was going in such a radically different direction before. Mm -hmm. And this particular version of her, I mean, it, it works so well on the page. It works so well against the other characters. And, and you see like like an Orso who has this kind of crazy abandon as a guy with privilege and can kind of do anything uh, versus a Gregor who has seen great challenges and has kind of pulled in and just tried to make himself this valiant type of person and, and to a certain degree, almost as like a, I don't want to say penance, but like a, a try, trying to improve upon the mistakes of, of his past. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Like I'm always, I'm always interested in seeing like what, when writers are, are are taking their characters and 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 finding their voice, because sometimes a character makes sense the moment you put it on the page, and other times you do have to like whittle away and whittle away and rework them. In redrafting after that, I mean, like, what kind of a chore was it to to reconstruct it when you knew the character needed to be overhauled? It sucked. <laughs> I cut a ton. I would say that I cut probably about fifty to hundred thousand words. Some of them I replaced. Some of them I didn't. One of the moments that things really clicked into place was that there's a there's a point in time in which there's a big heist that's very daunting and asks a lot of people. And one character was going to walk away and a second one was going to have to go after them and convince them to do it. And in the first version, it was actually Gregor. And he was chased after by Sancia to convince him to come and do the heist because he was like, no, I won't break laws. And I was like. This kind of, I guess this is good where it is on the page right now, but it's like he's not working. And it wasn't until later, actually, where I changed it to having it be Sancia who didn't want to do the heist and having it be Gregor who would come after her and be like, listen, I don't like breaking laws, but we have to do it right now for these reasons. That suddenly worked a lot more. And I think that that is a good thing to keep in mind when writing your protagonist is that your protagonist should not be certain. They should be uncertain. And, uh, and the point of the story is for them to figure out what it is that they believe and what they want to do. If they start out knowing who they are and they know what they do and they know what they value, that's going to suck to read unless it's to see the world just break them completely and have them completely have to rebuild themselves back up. But again, that's still like you have to make them uncertain through some process. Um, so having her be sort of a static character who was like, yeah, I don't like the merchant houses. Let's go after them was uh, not satisfying to read. It made a lot more sense to her to be like, listen, I've fought every single day to stay alive and I'm not going to throw it away now for this stupid plan that's been cooked up in a basement. And once I did that, I actually like that changed how I saw her in all the previous stuff that happened. And I went back and I rewrote a lot of scenes with her. But yeah, like looking back on how I first wrote her, like she was like a full on like rogue where like she would like do a job and then go out and get drunk and like have sex and, you know, getting all sorts of scrapes. And that's very different from the Sancho that she went up being, which was uh, sort of inspired by, by the noir films of like the 60s, like Play Samurai or even Drive, where it's a very lonely character in a big city that uh, is trying to stay focused on a job, but finds themselves challenged and forced to grow. That's a great plot. I mean, that's a great trope. It's a trope for a reason because it works. And it definitely works uh, in Foundry side. When it came down to the dialogue, like I've already said, like I mean, I feel like that the dialogue is is one of the the highlights of of the story. In, in your methodology for it, are you? How are you thinking about it when you're writing the dialogue? Are you reading this stuff out loud? Are you envisioning certain people and voices in your mind to kind of differentiate them? Do you you know have methods and tricks you use in order to keep that fresh and and make and really make them sing? I definitely have different voices in my head. 
I love to write scenes where they're all in a room together and they all fight about stuff. That's one of my favorite things to write is seeing people fight about and snark each other and get mad at each other about stuff. It's a, it's like a cheat to have it be like having to pull off a heist because there's a lot of stuff to fight about if you're planning a heist because everyone's worried and everyone's really anxious. But um, I, I always knew like which character was going to take which point of view of like this is dangerous or – I think that we might risk people's lives or I'm sure that this really doesn't matter that much. And that last one is probably going to be to, to be or so. Uh, so they, they definitely had uh, some very different ways of speaking like in my head as well as accents. They all have quite different accents in my head. And uh, yeah, it just, it just all worked. I, I like, I knew how they should, should talk on the page. I wrote a review for, for Foundry Side, and, and one note that I made at the end of it is that um, while this is not something that I do a lot of, um, occasionally I will read a book where I can, I can see the movie in my head. Like I can mm. see the actors, I can see the, like how, the, how it would come together, you know, who I would cast. I, like I said, it doesn't happen very often. This particular book had that for me, like where I, like, I felt like I could already see who would be what. Is there any of that in your mind? Or, and, and, and I feel like sometimes writers are, are not keen to, to give away who it is if they were thinking of somebody specifically. But did you ever have any of that, like where it was somebody casting in your head? Not really. I mean, like for one character, Yes. But one of the things that is left up to the reader uh, uh, to decide is that everyone is pretty much described as brown or dark. And so I want to leave it up to them as to what sort of person they're seeing for culture and this world. Uh, the one thing that I will say is that Orso feels like a, like, like a Hugh Laurie character, but not House, actually, from his older kind of comedy stuff where he – acts like a moron and he's and he's quite comedic and like like he overreacts to everything that's who i thought of Worso as and um in that case i have a general idea of like who the voice is but as for who the, who the audience should picture as that person i'll leave that entirely up to them there was a funny thing for me, like a, a weird like dissonance in that like there was a specific actor I saw in my head when I would think of Orso, but the voice in my head was almost something straight out of an anime, like like a big kind of like high pitched cackly like kind of yeah. manic, but, in, but like that sort of insane brilliance kind of thing. And so it was it was a weird it was a weird overlay in my head, but yeah, at the same time it was always super entertaining. So. The book is out now. It's the first book in the Founders trilogy, and I'm sure you're probably plowing ahead on the rest of it. But when you have time, when you're not at the Hugos or going to Dragon Con or doing all these other things and taking care of your kids and whatnot, what are you fueling your brain with? Like, what are you reading? What are you watching? What inspires you right now? I listen to a lot of history podcasts and lots of news podcasts. And like economic podcasts, I don't know why, but like nonfiction stuff really does it for me. I listen to a lot of nonfiction books these days just because the real world is so much stranger and both worse and better than you think. The way you think things came about isn't necessarily true. And there's a lot of uh, parts of our world that support our way of life that we never even think about that came about by accident or by sheer luck. Or it could be tons better if we had done this one thing, but then no, we didn't. Those sorts of things, the way that – the things that prompt me to think about the real world in new ways will, of course, bleed over to how I think about, about the worlds that I make up. And so that really helps me a lot. Uh, are you by any chance a, a fan of 99% Invisible? I am, yeah. I actually – that how, how I got into podcasts was um, – I used to work for um, a group of architects and I ran their conference and he was the first keynote speaker that I ever had to book was Roman Mars. And it was right before he blew up. So I was like, what the hell is a podcast? <laughs> why is that? Why is there a podcast about architecture and design? Uh, because I was like, that sounds like the dumbest thing in the world. So like I booked him and I had to like write up a whole lot of copies. So I listened to his podcast and right away I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. So I started listening to that, and then I just kind of got sucked in from there. I really think that that show gives an interesting look into the nature of the world around us and all the things we don't think about. 
Um, and I think yes. it's, I had the conversation with Lee Bardugo a while back about like that show and specifically that, that it's like, it gives you a framework for thinking about the design of the world and all the things that you don't normally notice and mm-hmm. all the intention that happens behind all of those things, all that stuff that we, that is just the background noise of our everyday lives that we don't think about the intent about the, the work that went into it, all the thought went to it that we just think is just there. And it's fascinating. Yeah, and like some of it is planned and some of it is by accident. And I think that the w- so the way that I come at it is looking at design as the way that it both shapes and is shaped by human interaction. And that um, there are some things that are built and are planned and are intentional uh, that shape the way that we live. And then there's some things where it's the way that we live that has created this odd way of design um, that kind of lives in perpetuity. Yeah, I like that. As you move on to the next uh, books in in the the Founders trilogy, is now that the the world is established and you know a lot of the framework for it and a lot of the world building, at least the thinking behind it is is there. Um, has anything changed about your writing process going to the next one? Does it feel basically the same, or has some, anything been overhauled? Well, I gotta plan it out more, a lot more, because. Boundary side is a, you know, it's a, it's a complicated story, but it's still fairly simple. And that there is a thief who steals something that's super bad. And then she has to do a bunch of stuff because of that. And now we are getting into where it's more of a struggle for power between two different forces. Uh, and now like each one has to act with intent. And with Foundry side, it was always very reactive where, oh my God, I did this thing. What do I do? Holy crap. Now I have to do this. No one ever really thought or made a pl- made like a plan that thought more than like three steps ahead, and so now um, we are going to have to look at what these two 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 forces are doing as they try and plot out their next moves, but also trying to look at at how power really works because the power there in Tavan has never been challenged really, and and it gets challenged in this book. And so the question sort of slowly turns to what did the powerful really do when they're challenged and how does it react? How does it change them? And how does it change the nature of the thing that they're trying to save? And um, it gets pretty loud. I'll put it that way. (laughs) Like I said, as a big fan of this book, uh, I'm really excited to see where that story goes next um i'm looking forward to seeing it get loud i certainly the um you know the end of foundry side is one of those uh those game changer things where you're like okay like everything that's led up to this has really paid off but all bets are off now this is you know this is an irrevocable change and i think that's a really exciting way to enter that next novel um when do you think that's coming along well i'm about halfway done um so and it's been really weird It, it it's really hard to write a book when it's prequel is getting like really nice reviews because you're like, Oh shit. Now I really got to make this one actually work. Especially if there's a scene that's just like not working. You're like, well, I'm screwed. But uh, I think it's going to be interesting because some of the characters wind up very powerful at the end of foundry side. And you, I had someone ask like, how are you going to make it where the world is challenging for them after this? And I was like, well, someone shows up that's even worse. And they were like, Oh, so it should be it should be a lot of fun. It should be like a giant face off kind of a thing. Yeah, escalating stakes. I like escalating that. Escalating stakes. Yeah. Well, Robert, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious. Um, as I noted beforehand, Foundryside is is available on all the things and all the places now. Mm-hmm. Uh, where should people be following your work otherwise? Uh, I want Twitter a lot for better or worse. <laughs> um, kind of wish I wasn't, but I don't know where to go anymore. Oh, I know. I'm in the same boat. Yeah. I'm like Instagram, but I don't, I, guess, I mean, like, I'm not like an especially photogenic person and I don't do a lot of cool things or own cool things anyway. Uh, and so like Snapchat, I don't even know how that worked and Facebook. I don't really want to see, you know, all my aunts and uncles like, so I don't know what to do anymore. So Twitter is where I'm at. Okay. So, and uh, what's your handle on Twitter? Uh, it is Robert J. Bennett. Do you ever uh, find the people mix up your name and call you Jackson Robert Bennett or Bennett Robert Jackson? Stuff All like that? the time. Like I'll like send an email and I'll say, thanks, Robert. And like, thanks, comma, Robert. And they'll like, you know, say, well, hi, Jackson. Here's my thoughts. 
And like one of the things, like I didn't really want to do the three name thing. Um, the problem was, was when I was about to get published, um, Robert Bennett is, was the Senator for Utah and he was a really big deal. And he was the first one to get kicked out of the tea party wave, but, uh, like if I recall. And, uh, so for search engine purposes, that was not great. And like, I was kind of struggling with it. And like, uh, my wife bought me a massage, like all, like on the last day that I, that I had to make a choice about it. And I walked in, I was like, hi, I'm Robert Bennett. I'm here for my massage. And the lady was like, Robert Bennett, that's my husband's name too. And I was like, God, <laughs> I can't keep this. It's too, it's too bland and boring. So I was like, R. Jackson Bennett or R.J. Bennett or whatever. So I went with Robert Jackson Bennett. And that was a mis- – and like that sounds cool. It sounds like a very like important person. Or, not- or a serial killer. Or a serial killer could be that. The thing that I realized is if you ever start signing a whole lot of stuff – you slowly realize that you have increased your workload by like a third. Oh. And you're like, man, why did I do this? So I'm slowly starting to try to change it to like signing it as 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 like as just RJ Bennett because holy God, like I think I had to do like a thousand book plates and um that took a lot longer than I thought it would, just because <laughs> you write that many words. I see uh, like Neil Gaiman post a lot of his like signing things and showing the, oh, here's all the books. And this took five hours of, of signing. And yeah. in the computer age where most of us spend time typing, if you don't sp- like me, like I can't hand write a page or something anymore without my hand cramping up. I can't even think yeah. about like me too. signing a thousand books. So yeah, like a form that I have to do for like health insurance purposes. I'm like, damn. That really hurts. Right, yeah, you're shaking it off, yeah. So, well, good good luck with that, because I think you would be signing the hell out of uh, a, a lot of <laughs> these going forward. Best of luck with the book. I think it's going to be a big deal, because um, it's, like I said, it's it's one of the most fun that I've read in a while, and I, th- and it, I think the buzz says a lot of people feel the same way. Uh, I'll be looking forward to the next thing, and uh, hopefully people will follow you out on the social and, and, uh, and keep up with you. And again, thank you so much for joining us on Fictitious. Sure, thank you. Thank you for having me. Fictitious is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Buskey, and co-produced by Wendy Buskey. You can find more episodes of the show at fictitiouspodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as fictitiouspod. And you can always come talk to me on Twitter, where I tweet as at Adrian Buskey. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon.